Monday nights, I'm trying to go live on YouTube in my Spanish channel. Uh, tonight, I'm interviewing my buddy, Timmy Ost. He was director of Youth Specialties Mexico while I was in Mexico. So we go way back. It's going to be a lot of fun. ¿Qué es lo que podemos hacer para realmente proclamar la esperanza en estos momentos difíciles? Mira, Denis, yo creo que para hablar de esperanza debemos de partir eh, del punto donde nos vemos cara a cara con nuestros temores. La, in la incertidumbre provoca temor. Hace unos días estaba leyendo un artículo y este artículo decía que 87% de las personas, eh, específicamente eh, en Estados Unidos, 87% han experimentado miedos que antes no tenían con, con, este, con esta crisis. 87. Entonces, 87%, imagínate, de cada 100 personas... 87 ahora tienen un miedo que no tenían. ¿Y cuáles son esos miedos? Por ejemplo, eh, hay gente que ahora tiene miedo de agarrar el dinero en efectivo, mm. porque qué virus viene en el dinero, o, o de, de agarrar el, el carrito del supermercado, porque qué si ahí está la bacteria, ¿no? Y entonces me llamó muchísimo la atención porque cada uno de nosotros enfrentamos los temores de una manera distinta. ¿No? Eh, hay algunos que son muy analíticos y, y entre más analítico eres, tu temor tiene cierto ángulo. Hay algunos que, que son más relajados, pero el hecho de que sean relajados no significa que no tengan miedo. Uh -huh. Entonces, en, este, en esta época he aprendido que que no todos van a enfrentar esta crisis como yo la voy a enfrentar. Muchas veces como líderes queremos ayudar a las personas como nosotros necesitamos ayuda o queremos inspirar y, e inyectar esperanza a otros como a nosotros nos gustaría. Pero en este tiempo he aprendido que tengo que hacerme un poquito para atrás, escuchar un poquito más y ser empático con las personas ¿no? que, que, que están a mi alrededor y entender, entender que no todos asimilamos los temores de la misma manera. Ajá. Tuesday morning staff meeting was quick today. Now we're going to head up to church and finish recording the message for Sunday. You know, one of my favorite things about Easter was the Sunday morning Easter basket. My uh, parents always had an Easter basket set up for us. Uh, and I remember it was uh, a big basket. And if you probably remember, it had the, the little green plastic fake grass in it and the little eggs, the plastic ones you could open up and there was candy inside. Sometimes there was a stuffed animal. Um, but I remember uh, always being some sort of like a large chocolate bunny. Uh, I remember as a child uh, receiving a, a big chocolate bunny and I could not wait to, to sink my teeth into it. Uh, so much chocolatey goodness and it was going to be the most satisfying, most fulfilling chocolate bunny ever. And, and I remember pulling it out of the package and I opened it up and I took a bite of its ear because that's how you eat a chocolate bunny. And, and then I, I bit down into it and it was hollowed out, it was empty inside. And, and I remembered I felt just cheated a little bit because I was expecting something so much bigger than what was actually there. And, and this bunny that was supposed to give me all this chocolatey goodness brings me to a very empty and unsatisfied feeling. Leaving church with all of my camera equipment Got the video shot. Now it's time to go home and edit. This is supposed to make me sound better on my live streams. 
but yeah, the lack of routine, I think is, it's kind of weird because we've been doing this for like two weeks now, maybe three, and we've kind of gotten into a different routine and I'm not convinced that I love it the way that it is. Um, yeah. but, but yeah, I think it's interesting to think about routine. And so what, what are some things that we can do maybe to establish a healthy pattern or mm -hmm. rhythm during this time? Do you, do you have some suggestions for that? Well, the same building blocks that are necessary to build a healthy marriage during a normal time are the same building blocks that are necessary to build a healthy marriage uh, during a crisis time. Although some of those building blocks, some of those fundamentals, the intensity and the necessity of focusing on those will change a little bit. And here's an example. Uh, when it comes to building intimacy, and I'm not talking about physical intimacy, I'm talking about emotional intimacy, uh, it starts with time. You have to be able to spend time with each other. Well, the challenge when it comes to time is we're spending all kinds of time together now. Where before you would go to work, have that separation from your spouse, that healthy separation from your spouse, come back home and almost be relieved and thankful that there is your spouse. Now you're able to engage them, debrief your day, uh, communicate with them, um, and connect. Well, we're, now we're having to identify when do we communicate, when do we not communicate, what do we communicate about, what do we not communicate about. And um, when I'm not communicating, and, I'm not upset. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like you would come home from work and if you didn't, if you ignored your wife, then there would be a problem. It would, some, some, a red flag would come up. And now it's like, like I'm in my basement. If I go upstairs and I don't say something to her, um, it's not necessarily that I am ignoring. It's just that maybe we just talked five minutes ago. Exactly. So even so reading those we, signals are kind of hard, right? Which is why we have to uh, proactively communicate. Um, I like to use the term painstakingly communicate. If your spouse looks at you and goes, okay, I get it. And you probably communicated to the level uh, to which you needed to communicate. Um, but spending time together Set aside established time specifically designated for connecting emotionally. And here's the difference. There's a difference between, honey, are you going to take out the trash today versus how are you feeling after you just had that bad work call that I heard you have upstairs? Um, the first conversation is necessary because you're talking about household roles and responsibilities that need to be fulfilled. The second conversation is just a general emotional check-in. Hey, how are you? Those are two different types of communication. And what my wife and I have done, and this is not necessarily uh, the trick for all couples, is we have designated post-work hours, um, whether it be after she comes home. I'm working from home. She's a medical person, uh, professional, so she's still in the field. Uh, so we may set aside some time uh, to debrief when she comes home. She tells me about her day. Uh, I tell her about my day, but then later in the evening after the kids have gone to bed, we've designated that time for a kind of deeper check-in time. How did you feel with uh, that bad phone call? She, she might ask me, how was it today? Did you feel overwhelmed uh, taking care of a dog, two kids, and trying to get on the podcast on time? <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's about designating and acknowledging uh, time for you and your spouse to specifically set aside uh, – that sounds bad. Set aside the kids. Just make sure you have time when the kids are not around, when the dog's not around, um, so that you're able to truly focus on each other and communicate. So I would I would say designate time. Identify and designate time for when you want to have those deeper conversations. Sit and be still. To Brian's point and to Ken's point, it, it's been a good challenge, but a challenge to really look at the relational level of where you are in your walk with Christ. Like, if, are you out in front of him? Because I think it's very easy to do sometimes when we have things to do, whether it's good things with good intention for your family or for your church or for your job. We have a schedule. We have a pace to keep up with. We have responsibilities to fulfill. And, you know, we keep Jesus with us, but is he in the back corner behind us? And this moment, this opportunity to strip these layers of distraction and really get into the Word and connect with people on an intentional level, which is strange that 
we had each other in person. But now somehow in the virtual world on video, there's this intentionality that exists because it's your only option. That it's that question of are you gonna you need to put Jesus in front of you. doing a little bit of uh, texting ministry this morning. We had crazy storms last night, blew some shingles off of our roof. Looks like maybe a tornado was around here somewhere. So I'm um, texting some of our people from church just to check in on them, see how they're doing. Also editing video for Sunday. Just finished the worship set for Sunday morning for Easter Sunday worship. It was incredible. I'm so pumped about it. I'm excited. These guys, I'm telling you what, we've got some great musicians at our church. I'm so thankful for them, for their sacrifice, and I uh, can't wait for Sunday. Have you ever felt abandoned? One time I was in Cuba and I got dropped off at a bus station. The guy that was supposed to come get me hadn't shown up yet. And so I had no way of contacting him and I just sat there for hours waiting for him. I felt alone and abandoned. One of the most famous phrases that Jesus said on the cross was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? And he said that because whenever he took on our sin, he was separated from God. Our sin separates us from God. But the reason that Jesus took on our sin and our abandonment from God was because he wanted us to be able to have a relationship forever with him. So now that Jesus has died for our sins and taken on that punishment and raised again, we can have the assurance that God is with us. So in Christ, you will never be abandoned by the all-powerful God of the universe. I wrote this devotional called Contemplating Christ, and basically Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday of this week, I have been sending it out to my mailing list and uh, just contemplating Jesus' walk through the final week of his uh, life before the crucifixion. And so every night I've been going um, live. So tonight I'm going to go live and talk about Good Friday and the crucifixion. And so there are these two things that I think we are holding in tension of being uh, so grateful to God for his grace and his sacrifice, and then being so sorrowful and repentant of our own sin. And those are the two things that I believe that we as Christians are constantly bringing to God. We know that we are sinners, that we are saved by grace, that there's nothing that we can do, but that God accepts us even while we are sinners, even while we are mocking him. And Jesus would say in the middle of his crucifixion, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Saturday morning, getting ready to record just one more video for this week um, for church, our church Facebook page. We've been trying to put out some pastor stuff every uh, day of the week. So I'm going to record a quick video and then um, go play, maybe. Christ be magnified from the altar 